All right. Thank you. <laughs> Turn your Bible, if you would, to First uh, Timothy three. Uh, good evening, and we will continue our word by word study of this chapter. God helping me, uh, and Lord willing. And to that end, let's read verse three. Uh, not given to wine. Actually, let's read verses 1 through 3 uh, so we remember the context. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So we're talking about two things. We're talking about a bishop who's supposed to be an example of what all believers are supposed to be. And secondly, we're talking uh, specifically about how a bishop should do his work and how he should be uh, the kind of man he should be in order to do uh, a good work. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And if you remember last time, I preached to you about no striker. And I made the point that uh, the four things that are listed here after not given to wine are actually two things repeating themselves. So no striker uh, is connected to not a brawler. And not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient is connected to not covetous. And uh, covetousness, or a lack of patience, uh, could be said another way. Covetousness, a lack of patience, or uh, in the plain, direct, offensive words of the King James Bible, not greedy of filthy lucre. I uh, I say that with tongue-in-cheek because they're not offensive to me at all. I'm just saying, <laughs> when you read the way some of these things are written, uh, that's why people start talking about needing a new version. Because Christians just shouldn't talk that way, is their argument. But the Bible doesn't pull any punches. It just throws it straight right across the plate, waist high, and uh, and no doesn't, doesn't play. The Bible's not playing. It is a ministry of the Holy Spirit, and, as, and part of that ministry, the Holy Spirit, is to reveal truth. And in doing that, he doesn't pander, like some of you preachers. He doesn't um, euphemize, like some of you. He doesn't hide and try to say things another way and tiptoe. He just says what needs to be said. Amen. And that's how you, that you should take a lesson from that. Um uh, as a preacher and a minister of Jesus Christ. Say what you mean, mean what you say, uh, my dad used to say. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. And not covetous is what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Lord willing, I'll preach to you about it. And covetousness is a huge problem. It's a huge problem in the United States because it is the definition of our culture. Uh, we live in the land of opportunity. And we uh, have adopted a system called capitalism uh, whose basic root tenet is that uh, we can have the things that we want if we work hard for them. That you can go out and get the things that you want. And if you do not do that, there's something wrong with you. So it's moved from a political system, from an economic system, it's moved from that to the manner in which people evaluate us morally. See, it's a religion, capitalism is. You can have the things that you want to have physically in this country. You should have them. You deserve to have them. There isn't any reason why you shouldn't have them. And that is what is meant at its core by the phrase, um, the pursuit of happiness, connected with the right to own land. Now, uh not so in the Word of God. <laughs> Not that uh, you can't be happy and have joy, but the source of your joy should not be the things that you have. Amen. 
because the picture in the Bible and the instruction in the Bible uh, and the examples of the people uh, in the Bible, such as the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles, and specifically the Apostle Paul, their instruction, uh, their spirit, and their example, not one of them uh, had a career where they try to make a name for themselves and make a bunch of money and retire. Not one of them. Nor is that the instructions. And we're going to talk a little bit, or I'm going to preach a little bit about the instructions. If you have something to add, please add it. Amen. Um, but the Bible says, uh, and the reason, uh, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, and again, not covetous. So this is a huge problem, and, and it's a huge problem. We know that it's a huge problem, not just because it's just evident and manifest. You just look around, and that's the way things are. That's the spirit of the age. That's the consciousness of everybody in the country. And that is a doctrine of American Christians, which is wicked and evil, and it leads to other things that are also wicked and evil that we'll, that I'll show you tonight. But one of the reasons why we know that it's a huge problem is because it's mentioned so many times in the New Testament. He says here that a preacher should not be, uh, a, a bishop specifically, should not be greedy of filthy lucre but patient, not covetousness, not covetous. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, turn there. In 1 Corinthians 5, we read about covetousness as being on the same level uh, as it has to do with your fellowship as fornication and drunkenness. But you don't think about it that way, do you? Because everybody in America is covetous. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, look down in verse uh, 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must, then, for, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no not to eat. So this specifically in the context is talking about somebody in the church that you're a part of who is covetous or a fornicator or an idolater or a railer. And people that even know about this passage, which aren't that many, because folks just don't read their Bibles, let's face it. But people that even know about this passage never emphasize anything other than the fornication. Now, fornication is the context of what was what had happened and what he was rebuking them for. Amen. Not that it's a good thing, but that it's true. Amen. That it's that that's true. But in this list, which he lists twice, once in verse ten and once in verse eleven, he says, "I'm not talking about people in the world because if you stayed away from people in the world, you just just have to leave the world, and you can't, you know, like everybody, you know." If Donald Trump gets elected, I'm leaving the country. And, of course, none of them did. You'd have to leave the world to escape fornicators because everybody fornicates. Right? You'd have to leave the world uh, to escape covetousness and extortion because everybody is covetous and an extortioner. I'm obviously speaking with... Uh, uh, em- making emphasis, exaggerating for the purpose of emphasis, but not really that much, because in, with respect to covetousness, because with fornication, it's because okay, you're not a fornicator, but that's just because you haven't had the opportunity, and girls don't like you. Maybe you're not a fornicator. You're not not a fornicator on principle, probably, as a kid. Think back to your high school years, and judge yourself. Did you keep yourself from marriage because of your for marriage, did you say, did you keep yourself and preserve yourself for marriage because of your high moral character and strength? Or cause it, it's cause it just wasn't that easy and you didn't have the opportunity. And God protected you and kept you from it. See? Judge yourself. So with covet, and I'm judging myself in those things too. 
Uh, covetousness is on the same level as, of fornication. And he said, if a man that in these three verses, if a man that is called a brother is covetous, then you shouldn't even eat with that brother. But yet that's the brother that invites you to their home for a big fancy meal. Because they can. See? Covetousness. Now, what I'm preaching to you about just tonight, just like last week, <laughs> and frankly, almost every time I look in the Bible, I get my head bashed in with these things. Uh, covetousness. Uh, covetousness is a huge problem. And it's not just, well, it's a problem we need to work on. Fi- no, you need to fix it right now. The same advice that you would give to a fornicator about what, how he should handle his fornication is the advice that you should give to a covetous man. Because here it's on the same level as fornication, and it should affect your fellowship uh, with them, or they with you, if you're the covetous man. See. Secondly, covetousness is idolatry. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3, and look in verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So you go reading through the Old Testament and look at what is meant by idolatry um, and what God thinks of idolatry. Um, and the Bible says in, in Acts 17, at the times of this ignorance God winked at, referring specifically to the idolatry of the Gentiles. But look at how he dealt with people that knew better because they had the law, the Jews. Idolatry. And uh, not only is it wicked and evil, but it's wicked and evil because God hates it and God punishes it harshly All th- on every page of the Old Testament. He said, I am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right? And so as a Christian in the United States, you got it down that you're not supposed to go to a Buddhist temple. Most of you. Some of you. A few of you. Maybe a couple. Because there's plenty of you that are that messed up. Amen. <laughs> you got it down even probably uh, that you're not supposed to go to a Catholic church where they have gargoyles uh, and, uh, to use the Bible word, statues of devils uh, mounted on the wall. And, and various uh, likenesses of things in heaven and earth that you're not supposed to make or bow down thyself to or worship to. Or worship, and uh, you go to St. Peter's in, in in Rome, and kiss the. We're not allowed to kiss the ring now, probably because of COVID. <laughs> but for thousands, of, for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, people go kiss that ring. It's so worn from people kissing it and kneeling before it. Say, what is that? That's idolatry. That's something that God hates. And the Bible says that covetousness is idolatry. Because maybe you're not worshiping a statue, but you're worshiping something else when you covet. Amen. Uh, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2. And look in verse 17. And this is a, the, what the verse we're about to read is a picture and an example of the difference between covetousness And how you're supposed to be. How you're supposed to act. Especially with respect to um, covetousness being idolatry and you worshiping something when you covet. Verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. So he starts off in verse 17 by saying... That I am happy to give my time, my energy, my life, my money-making potential, 
my all the things that I could have for myself. I'm happy to sacrifice for the sake of the increase of somebody else's faith. I'm here for you. I'm not here preaching, and here in this case tonight, I'm not here preaching to you for my own sake. I already got bashed in the head with a 4 by 4 this week when God was preaching this to me. (laughs) I'm giving these things to you, and I'm risking you not liking me because of my tone of voice or the direct things that I'm saying from the Scripture or the offense that it is bound to have because of my directness that the Holy Spirit leads me uh, to, to be and say and to preach. The foolishness of preaching. God had chosen the foolishness of preaching to say them that believe. And because I'm not using my own wisdom in how I put together these messages and deliver them. And because I'm not smooth and I don't know how to, uh, what's the word? Smoo- smooch. Smooch. Uh, uh, you know, make contacts and network and, and I'm not good with getting people to like me and, and making a network of people that I can then hit up for, for favor. I'm just not good at that. And I don't want to be good at that. And I don't think that's a good thing. Amen. Well, he that hath friends must show himself friendly. Yeah. It's not the job of a preacher to make friends. It's a job of the preacher to deliver the message that God gave to him. And to have the burden of the word of the Lord in doing that. What I care about is you getting it. What I care about is you is committing these things to you in your heart of hearts and soul of souls. What I care about is seeing your faith grow. That's what I want. Not numbers or gain of any kind. And that's what Paul is saying here in the verse. Yea, and if I be offered which means you sacrifice something when you help somebody to grow in faith. And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Meaning you're happy to have your faith increased by my sacrifice. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy as shortly unto you. That I also may know that I, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. See, I want your faith to increase, and I care about you, and I want to know how you're doing. Not how much money you're making, or how big your house is. I want to know how your faith is doing. When I know your state, he says, and that's going to comfort me when you report to me something that you learn and grow and grow in the Word of God. That's going to comfort me and help me. Amen. For all seek their, or uh, look at verse 20. For I, this is the reason why he's going to send Timothy, not anybody else. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. See, because the other folks that were traveling on rhythm don't care enough about you. Naturally. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. And that right there is the root of the difference between a Christian who is covetous and a Christian who seeks to live a life of service to others. Who, who seeks to follow God in the things that he learns. Who, who has offered his body to God as a living sacrifice. Presented is the word. Because everybody else is not that way. Verse 22, But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. See? And there's more to it, Paul sending people to find out how they're doing, because he wants to know how they're doing. But the root of that, and I love the way that's worded, is you should not be in the business, your life should not be about yourself and your own things. You should you should live a life that seeks to serve Jesus Christ and His will. That's the root of the issue. That's, uh, Lord, let this cup, if it be uh, possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but Thine. 
It's the same issue. Because when you are covetous, you not only turn your heart away from the things that God has told you to hope in and begin to hope in other things, you put yourself in a position where other Christians are told not to fellowship with you. And you also put yourself in a position where uh, the Bible says of you that you seek your own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Say, what is that? That's Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Amen? Covetousness. It's on the same level uh, as fornication. It affects, fell, it should affect fellowship, but I can't think of one case where it has. Usually, usually Christians flock to, to people who are affluent. I know preachers do. But the picture in the New Testament of what the church is, it is what it's an example of is, uh, is not that. It, it's the opposite of that. It's, it's contentment. But before we get that, I got one more point. Covetousness is a big deal. It's not a small thing that you can look past. It's a huge deal because if you are, if you are uh, a covetous man, according to the Bible, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. You say, well, I mean, I did, well, I did this, this, and this. I'm going to get, not if you're covetous. Turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and look down in verse uh, 1. Be therefore followers of God. Who are you to say what rewards I'm going to get? I'm not saying it. I'm reading it to you off the page of this book. Ephesians chapter 5. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And hath given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So what that's saying is the same thing that we just saw pictured in Philippians uh, 2. We're supposed to love one another, and what that means beyond forgiveness, chapter 4, verse 32, is sacrificing and offering ourselves for each other, verse 2. Because that's what Christ did for us. So that's how we should be towards each other. But not you. You have a right to your liberties. You have a right uh, to your land. You have a right to your privacy. You have a right to all the things that you refuse to sacrifice. Not, and I'm not telling you have to go, you know, sell everything. But what I am saying is that your life should be about sacrifice and service to your fellow Christian as, uh, as, uh, as what loving one another should look like. Amen. Verse three, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. So everybody's got problems, right? Nobody's perfect. If, uh, if, if, if any be overtaken in a fault, uh, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness in those things. But covetousness is something that, that shouldn't be tolerated, just like fornication shouldn't. See? Let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, or unclean person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, because covetousness is idolatry, we read in uh, Colossians, have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And you might, if you're fortunate enough, hear a message against fornication from this passage and how no fornicator has any inheritance in the kingdom and how you shouldn't fornicate and be not partakers with them in fornication and drunkenness. Because who doesn't know that fornication and drunkenness is wicked and evil? Everybody knows that, even lost people. What I'm talking to you about tonight, 
what I'm preaching to you, what I'm trying to commit to you, is that no covetous man hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So if you thought you were going to get some kind of a reward at the judgment seat of Christ for something good that you did, it has been undone by your covetousness. Covetousness. If so be that you are, as the Bible describes, a covetous man. Now think about that and consider. Covetous is not just something that you can be gracious about. Something that you can look past. Something that you you can uh, allow in yourself. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, he said in 1 John 5. That's instructions that he gave to a kid who couldn't bear deep spiritual things. Little children, he said. Amen, amen, amen. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And I say to you that don't be covetous. Thou shalt not covet is the sincere milk of the word for babies. But not for you, American. Because you already have your doctrine of capitalism and success. And go out and make something of yourself. And uh, and blah, 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 not Bible. Bible. B-I-B-L-E. I'm preaching to you out of the words of the New Testament and specifically the words of Paul the Apostle. Uh, and I'm not saying it only applies to us. It's the same principle that applies to everybody except God through all history, except God had mercy on the Gentiles and winked at the idolatry of the Gentiles in the Old Testament because they didn't have the law, Acts 17. But now, <laughs> we're not in the times of those ignorance anymore. All right, so covetousness is a real problem. It's not a small problem. It's a real problem for everybody. Now, it's a real problem for everybody, but it's specifically a real problem for preachers because preachers are supposed to be in ex- uh, ministers of Jesus Christ, bishops, because they're supposed to be examples to others as to what a Christian should be. It's not do as I say, not as I do. It's no, you're supposed to example and demonstrate to me uh, how I'm supposed to be. And I'm supposed to do that for you. So, when you think about everything that you've seen in your Christian life, in Christian circles, it just paints things in a whole different light, doesn't it? Turn to, uh, uh, back to first. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. The reason why uh, we read about it in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that you should not be that, is not only because uh, because you're supposed to be an example of what all Christians are not supposed to be, but also because it's a real problem with ministers in particular. Because they, they start to get uh, into a position of leadership and spiritual authority and all of a sudden they think that means that they can manhandle people, uh, that they can fleece them instead of feeding them, that they, uh, they, they don't want to live by faith, so they invent a doctrine called tithing for the New Testament Christian where they guarantee themselves a salary instead of living by faith from week to week and relying on offerings. And uh, thou shalt not tread, tread uh, muzzle the ox that treadeth out, out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his hire. And they that preach the gospel should live off, off of the gospel, live of the gospel, and that is absolutely true and right and good. But there's a huge difference between an offering and a required tithe. And the Bible forbids the, the latter in the book of Second Corinthians. And I'm not preaching that tonight, but it's an example of covetousness. Uh, and it's a real problem for preachers. Turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Preachers in particular are susceptible to the temptation uh, of covetousness and money. They get a couple people uh, that they're responsible to oversee, and all of a sudden they think they can rule them with a rod of iron. They get a couple people that they're responsible to see and they think they should pay them all their money. 
They get, they get a couple people that they're responsible to oversee. Uh, first Peter chapter five and look in verse two. Here's what, here's what a minister of the word of God is supposed to do. Feed, first Peter chapter five and verse two. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. So one of the things that you're supposed to be an example of is in the previous verse, not not for filthy lucre. You don't do your job for the purpose of making money. You do your job for the purpose of pleasing Jesus Christ and being a good minister of Jesus Christ and following the instructions. But you stepped off it, preacher, most of you. Most of you. And in stepping off of it, you let all of your flock understand and know that this American doctrine of capitalism is right for a Christian. And it is not. It is contrary to the teaching of the New Testament and how you should be. Amen. Now, that doesn't stop preachers. That, what I just said, doesn't stop preachers from being how they are. Uh, I've never been successful at convincing uh, uh, someone who is an authority over me of anything. Anytime I try to talk to them uh, privately. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. And by the way, that's mentioned there in 1 Peter 5. It's mentioned in 1 Peter 3. It's repeatedly mentioned in the context of ministers because it's a huge problem among ministers. Turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And look in verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many have not seen my face in the flesh. That's an uh, inner conflict in his heart, praying, praying to God for him. Verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. And this is what he's praying for them. And unto all riches, or I'm sorry, I'm in Colossians. I'm in the wrong book. First Thessalonians 2. Uh, look in verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. For even after that, we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Okay, so we were bold. We spoke to you the gospel and we did it with much contention, meaning you contended with us in it. It wasn't just an easy reception. <laughs> Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, which it often is, nor of uncleanness, which it often is, nor in guile, which it often is, not in Paul's case, but among preachers, just look around. Just watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, amen. Verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, see? Because as a preacher and a minister of the word of God, you have a sacred trust, and God lets you preach the gospel. And you abuse that trust, when you make it a cloak of covetousness, when you come up with smooth words about the gospel and being saved and bless uh, God uh, and all the things, when your actual motive is to increase, that's what's called a cloak of covetousness. Not as pleasing men, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts, for neither at any time used we flattering words as ye know <laughs> you know that right <laughs> nor a cloak of covetousness God is witness see cloak of covetousness that means I'm saying one thing when my actual motive is because I want something from you I want you to support my ministry uh, uh, financially 
I want you, I'm, I'll go to a, a preacher and talk to him and make friends with him and fellowship with him and listen to his preaching and try to impart some spiritual gift to him for the purpose of him letting him, letting me use my building for my education ministry for kids. That's called a cloak of covetousness. That's, that's preaching one thing and saying one thing when you're, when, when, what you're actually after is I want something from you. Not necessarily an increase of faith. I want you to give uh, yourself, not to God, but to me. I want you to give your money. I want you to give your time for my ministry so that I can gain, so that I can have big numbers to report, so that the lost world can respect me and think that I'm uh, respectable because so many people uh, follow me. I want you to name yourself after me as exampled in 1 Corinthians 3 and all Bible believers. That's a cloak of covetousness. See? But God, helping me, I don't want any of those things from you. What I want is to see your faith increased. I don't know, I want to obey God and please God. That's why I don't make these rules to, to, to try to help people to stick around more when I teach Bible memory. I don't try to make a structure that forces them to see it through. I just let it be in, in honesty and in truth. Look, brother, this is what you should do. This is how to do it day by day. You going to do it? I can give you a certificate if that makes you feel better after a year or two. But that don't mean nothing. What means nothing, what means something is what you did it and more, what you did and more importantly, why you did it and who you did it for. I want to see your faith increased. I want to see the Word of God in you. And I'm not trying to change the world or the country. This is person to person. Amen is the picture in the New Testament. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me, he said in Romans 1. Amen? Amen. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. So it's a huge problem among preachers. It's mentioned in 1 Peter as what you're not supposed to do. It's mentioned in 1 Timothy in the context of a bishop as what you're not supposed to be. And turn to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And it's mentioned again in Peter... as a warning for the rest of y'all to stay away from people that are covetous. Amen. 1 Peter 2. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I want 2 Peter. I do. I want 2 Peter 2. And starting in verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Notice the wording. They shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Notice the Lord that bought them. So, not even saying that these are lost people. Uh, Peter, James, and John in Galatians 2 are called false brethren, uh, because they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel in the way that they dealt with people of other races. Uh, Galatians 2. Verse 2, uh, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, who by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, uh, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and so on and so forth, examples of God's judgment, uh, also in Jude. And there, I'm not saying that there's not specific application to some of these things in Peter to the tribulation. But it certainly matches 
uh, what everything that Paul said, and is a clear picture of, of some of these preachers who, with feigned words through covetousness, make merchandise of you. I don't know how it could be plainer than that. Which is why you should mark them and avoid them. Amen? All right, turn to First Timothy 6. First Timothy 6. Not only it is a, is a huge deal, uh, because it's on the same level as uh, fornication, extortion, and other things, it's a huge deal because it's mentioned in the context of bishops of what they're not supposed to be. Uh, not only because it's a huge problem among them, but also because they're supposed to be examples of what everyone's supposed to be. And none of us are supposed to be covetousness. First Timothy 6. It is also the source and the effect, the, it is both the cause and the effect of uh, everything else that preachers become. That is to say, um, in verse 4, proud, ignorant, uh, just evil, envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, uh, destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. That is the effect of the love of money. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? So that's the cause. But it's also, but it's also the effect because evil men seduce for show acts worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. See? So you might start off good, but you're, the reason why your doctrine's all messed up, the reason why you don't believe in authority on this earth, uh, the, the kind of authority that's talked about in, in the beginning of the chapter with servants and masters, the reasons why, the reason why you can't recognize that as true and preach it and have it be part of your doctrinal statement is because you love money. And specifically in the words of verse six, excuse me, verse five, gain, which has a broader application than just dollars. See? But here's what you're supposed to be. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice the play on words. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So this is First Timothy, called a pastoral epistle because um, it is written specifically to ministers of Jesus Christ, to preachers of the Word of God. Um, as well as to everybody who's also supposed to be this way. And notice the definition of how you're supposed to be is to be content that you got clothes on your back and food to eat. Nothing about shelter. Foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Amen. But they that will be rich, which is set in in opposition to what you just read. So not this is rich. <laughs> but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See? So when you set your heart on things on the earth, it's the same basic principle that is talked about in the Gospels, in Colossians, in Philippians, in almost every book that Paul writes, that your reward, your expectation, your hope should not be on this earth. It should be in Jesus Christ and His appearing. Looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope, he said. Uh, in Titus chapter 2. The blessed hope of what? A good retirement? Blessed hope of what? A good job? Lots of money? Blessed hope of what? Well, I'm going to be a rich uh, lawyer uh, and uh, be a, a faithful church member and show everybody that you're you're allowed to be rich as a Christian. Okay, if God dumps that on you and doesn't give you any choice and, and that's just what happens in, uh, in spite of yourself, 
then I got no argument with you. But read the wording. But they that will be rich, they that will be rich, they that desire to be rich and and make decisions to the end that they become rich. See? This has to do with where your affection is. Not what God dumped on you. Because that case that I just mentioned, I'm being extremely gracious, it just doesn't happen that much to people. (laughs) I mean, I've been living in this world almost half a century, and I can tell you, it just doesn't happen. I mean, it happened to me. God helping me. But that was in spite of myself. I think I demonstrated with the previous, before I met Anne-Marie, 40 years of my life that I'm not interested in making a lot of money. <laughs> God helping me. Uh, you know, and, I, and not that I'm not also guilty of covetousness at times, and God forgive me for that, and God help me to overcome it. But here's how you overcome it, is to be content with food and raiment. Here's how else you overcome it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, Hebrews, book of Hebrews, obviously it's written to the Hebrews as it's titled. Um, and we're about to read something, and your argument is no doubt going to be, well, that applies to Jews in the tribulation, and there's a difference between rich and poor people in the, in the new, in the tribulation. That's not the case in the church. It's only not the case in this age right now, uh, because of your doctrine of being American. It actually, in truth, is the case in the New Testament because what I'm about to read to you matches exactly what Paul said and what Jesus Christ said. Hebrews chapter 13, look down in verse 5. Let your conversation be, that's uh, not just your talk, but your manner of life, the way that you live your life, without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know what that is? That you put your trust in Jesus Christ and you follow him. You don't put your trust in your bank account, in your income, in your job, in your ability to make money. And when something bad happens and God delivers you, and it wasn't your money that delivered you, then you can say boldly that Jesus Christ uh, delivered you and you can trust him and he helps you. And I ain't afraid of you because I can't count the number of times that Jesus Christ helped me when I was in a ditch with no money and spit upon and judged. And I tried to impart spiritual things to everybody that I met and they laughed at me and mocked me and wouldn't hear me and didn't take me seriously, not because I wasn't professional in my the way that I spoke or articulate, or not because I wasn't quoting scripture to them and calm and sane, not because of any of those th- things, but because I was poor and didn't have a place to live. There's something wrong with that guy. He's off. That guy's crazy. He doesn't think he needs a place to live. Believe me, I'd love a place to live. It's just not on the table right now. Amen? And that's how every one of you should be. Foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Jesus Christ exampled that in the way that he lived his entire life. But now you, preacher, you, you can't even, you can't even get your dispensations right. You can't rightly divide. You, you can't get the basic doctrine of 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2 that slay, slaves uh, or in the words of the verse, servants should obey their masters and do them service. You can't even get that because of your love of money. And that's just the most obvious glaring thing. If we start getting into it, I think all of the other things your doctrine uh, is messed up about is going to come out. See? Covetous. Covetousness. Covetousness. But if you follow the basic principles, principle of the New Testament to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, in the words of Colossians 3, to lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves do break through and steal, in the words of uh, Matthew 6, to uh, 
watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and judge uh, for yourself the covetousness in others and apply 1 Corinthians 5 as appropriate. Uh, as in Philippians chapter 3, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, whose end is destruction, whose, uh, whose, end, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. But here's how to save yourself from that. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the same thing with... Uh, you don't need to take up arms. You don't need to take things into your own hands. Uh, you can put your trust and your life and your family's life in God's hands, whose hands are much stronger than yours and who knows better how to protect you. See? See? That's a hard lesson to learn because everybody in your life from birth in this country teaches you the opposite of that, including myself. But I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says in the New Testament for the Christian and specifically the things that he's given you to hope to and to cling to and to trust in to be delivered uh, from evil. Namely, the appearance of of Jesus Christ, the redemption of our body, the adoption. For our conversation is in heaven. From We don't mind earthly things. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I'll say amen if you want. Turn to, uh, turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And start in verse uh, 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. All right, so obviously there's an inheritance. It's supposed to be split between him and his brother. And he's not getting what he thinks he deserves from the inheritance. And Jesus said in verse 14, and he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? It's not my job to make sure you get your inheritance, he said. <laughs> and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. See? Your things are not your life. Your fancy house and your nice car are not your life. Your thousands of dollars that you paid for a bicycle are not your life. Your bank account is not your life. Your library is not your life. Jesus Christ should be your life in the words of this book. And your family and your ministry and the people that you sacrifice yourself so that their faith can increase. Verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself. Notice, uh, for I have no man like-minded, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's, and is not rich towards God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither your body, what ye shall put on, because inevitably that's going to be your counter-argument. Well, you have to take care of yourself. You have to have food and clothes. You have to uh, provide for your family. Jesus said, don't worry about those things. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, 
which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them, how much more are ye better than the fowls? So, take that, you uh, animal rights activist. <laughs> but also, take that, covetous Christian, because you are better than the animals, and God takes care of all them. They don't starve. And which of you, taking thought, can add one stat, one, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, which is a reference to what is promised if you're not covetous. Now, these other verses in the rest of the chapter have context, I believe, uh, to the that time, because the kingdom of God was immediately at hand. But this being content with such things as ye have, and setting your affection on things above, and not giving thought for tomorrow, or the needs thereof, but trusting God to supply and just obeying him day, to, day by day, that's for right now. Because it matches what Paul said in the New Testament. So I was pretty hard on preachers tonight. As I should have been. Amen. God helping me. And I hope that I was pretty hard on us as well. Because all of us have erred to some degree and in some manner. And we need to get that straight in our hearts. So that what we patiently wait for, in the words of Romans chapter 8, is not any of the things that this world offers, but rather what Jesus Christ promised and is certain. His coming, His appearing, we shall be changed. Would you close in a word of prayer? Lord, thanks for your word. Thank you for the admission of the churches. I pray that you will continue to teach us First Timothy and that we'll learn your words. I think I ask that you'll help us to continue to testify and to preach, um, whether people agree or not, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Um, like you said, the Lord has spoken who can but prophesy. Um, You've told us exactly what you want us to do, so help us not just to preach it and testify of what's true, but also to obey it, to make it um, the most important thing in our lives, the main aim of our heart to follow and obey the things that you tell us while we read and study your words. And I thank you for the preaching tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.